Hello, it's Dr. Sarah Walton, founder of Soul Writing. Welcome. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, you are going to get some writing tips and if you follow me, you will know that you either get a meditation exercise to give you practice using your intuition to write or you get some more technical writing tips. Today I'm going to give you a few technical writing tips, but I'm going to do that by reading you a short section from chapter 18 in Sophia's Tale, my latest book. Um, Sophia's Tale is a fairy tale for adults. Why for adults? Because there's some sex in it. So today we're going to be focused on writing sex in fiction. Now, writing sex in fiction, as, as all writers know, is one of those things that's particularly tricky. Um, there is even a bad sex um, writing competition. I'm not sure that anyone actually enters it intentionally, um, and I really, really wouldn't want to ever end up winning it. Um, and this, was, this has always been in my mind when I'm writing any sex scenes in fiction, um, because it's really difficult to write sex scenes. They can either end up sounding too pornographic or too cheesy. Um, so I would say to you, be careful how you use sex in fiction. The rule of thumb that I use, and this isn't going to be for everyone, if you're writing erotic fiction, this is definitely not for you. But for me, my rule of thumb is the sex needs to have a function either in terms of the plot or the characterization. It needs to be moving forward, the reader's understanding of the plot, so moving the action forward, or the reader's understanding of the characterization. And in terms of the characterization side of things, that may also include moving forward some of the themes and giving the reader more information about some of the themes in the book. Now, I have written about sex a, a, a number of times, um, and in every, six, every single time, the sex has a plot function. In this particular book, in Sophia's Tale, the function of the sex um, has, is, is to demonstrate the sacred union and the rising of the Kundalini. So if you're not familiar with that term, it's, it's your energy that rises up from your sacrum to the crown, to, crown of your head. Anyone who's used to doing Kundalini yoga or um, energy work, um, chakra work, then you'll be familiar with it. But basically there is an energy system, it's an invisible system, which a number of belief systems believe in, um, which is that there are certain energy points within the body. There's lots and lots of them actually, but the traditional ones are the chakra system. Now this book, uh, Sophia's Tale, is not um, a book based on Hinduism or any um, particular religious um, group at all, but it does take some um, lessons, let's say, or some, some uh, some things that I've picked up around energy work because I work with energy um, along the way and is particularly interested in what happens when two people engage in, um, in physical um, side of their relationship and how sex can help to move the energy within the body if you are interested in doing that and trying it with your partner, you may want to uh, read chapter 18 of Sophia's Tale. Um, one of the reviewers for this book was a Buddhist monk. And he said, um, although it's not part of the review, but he said to me that my um, description of the sacred union of uh, it's a man and a woman in this book, but it, it could apply to same sex unions as well. I would want to, I do want to emphasize that. Um, but in this book, it's between a man and woman, and he said it was a particularly good description of uh, the movement of energy um, by two people who are very focused on using um, the uh, using sex in their relationship and love making in their relationship in order to practice energy work. So you could say that the sex in my novel, Sophia's Tale, performs the function of passionate enlightenment. So 
If you would like to be passionately enlightened, um, I'm now going to read a, a short section from chapter 18. So it's quite a way into the book, so you need to know a few things first. Um, Sophia is the goddess of wisdom, and the whole book is about her journey to become wise. Um, and at this point, she's rescued in the desert where she um, has got lost um, by a desert tribe, a nomad tribe called the Bessin. And in this scene, she takes a fancy to a water finder called Yeseleb, who is performing the dance of the snake. In Gnostic stories, and this novel is a uh, short novella, is based on a ancient Gnostic manuscript. Um, so Gnostics uh, were the early, very early Christians in the second century. And in the fourth century, um, the story of the goddess of wisdom was kicked out of the Bible along with the goddess of wisdom. So the divine feminine. Um, wisdom was, was uh, banished from the Bible, edited out, deleted, as females sometimes are from history. And so in Gnostic stories, what you need to know is that the snake or the serpent was not the devil, as it often is in traditional Christian stories. The snake represented wisdom. So you need to understand the snake is a, a good a good guy, a good character, a benevolent creature in Sophia's tale. So here we go. Her paranoid thoughts dissolved as Yeseleb's strong hand grasped her waist and began to move her slowly to the rhythm of Bessin drums. And she swayed to the sacred dance of the snake. Her body responded with fire from a place silent and alive. From the memory of the body arose a dance, a wordless and free. And Sophia danced the dance of the seven veils. Although Sophia did not remember her schooling in the city of rainbow light, nor the Empress Harim, the body never forgets. Unlike her performance in the Palace of Diamonds, Sophia had no desire to conquer Yeseleb's heart by being a spectacle of arousal. Instead, she experienced a deep yearning to join with him in the rhythm of the dance and whirled faster and faster until she experienced an unexpected sensation of stillness. She and Yeseleb were still in the center of the dance and for a brief time, the fire, music and clapping span around the axis of their silence. The stillness was broken by the people who gathered around the couple closer and closer, guiding them towards the pink tent that had been prepared for them. As they entered the marriage tent, youngers greeted the couple in the language of their ancestors and placed identical strings of diamonds around their necks, committing them to 13 moons together. as was the tradition. Separated by a curtain of lapis lazuli, Sophia and Yeseleb were washed and prepared for each other with oils and sacred snakes were brought in as witnesses to the sacred act. Sophia felt lost and as a, she again stood on the brink of the unknown. When the curtain was pulled back, she recalled a memory. The memory was of men faceless and numerous, visiting her room in the house of poppies with the memory of a dark red imprint of hum humiliation made her cheeks burn. I am Birakana, she whispered. And Birakana, in the language of this novel, means prostitute. I am Birakana, she whispered, trying to hide her naked moon-white skin from Yeseleb. All Bessin women are Birukana, replied Yeseleb, and he hovered his fingers over the place where she throbbed with desire and shame. We honour the palate of a woman through which she can taste the divine. When her palate 
tastes the salts of love, the serpent within will rise. Yeselab traced a line up Sophia's tingling spine with his other finger. Sophia remained cross-legged, facing him. Shame dissolved and she felt beautiful and moved by the words of her bridegroom. She was surprised by the respect for her body and more surprised that she, a Birakana, felt like a novice. For Sophia knew the moves of the sacred act, but this was the first time she was not used as a tool for man's pleasure. Beyond flesh and blood, sacred rituals lay dormant. The wisdom body awaits its patient practice. Yeseleb continued his wandering discovery of her body. With the same patience, he searched for water. You must learn to receive love. Your body is too accustomed to giving. Sophia did not interrupt her bridegroom. Nor did she give way to her desire, but patiently received and learned that a woman can receive without submitting. Yeseleb looked deep into Sophia's eyes as he caressed her body. Imagine your mind's clear eye, a serpent awakening and uncurling from the space of your spine until its head arrives at your crown. When our bodies join, imagine a gold light fills the body of the serpent and use your will to seduce the white light to travel up through the invisible golden corridor made by the serpent until it reaches your crown. Your focus, if your focus fails, falls to your yoni, bring the serpent back up to the crown of your head. All the while, Yeseleb caressed and felt his way around Sophia's perfumed body, letting the desire touch lead his hands in its wordless wisdom. Time unfolded into eternity, returning spasmodically as they resisted the climax their impatient bodies tried to trick them into seizing before the white light completed its journey. Up their spines, and to the crown of their heads. At these moments, they would close their eyes and focus on the light of the sacred snakes within them, etching the invisible golden channel to the moon above, or connect by looking into each other's eyes and resting the focus of their heart in their hearts into which they poured love to balance their desire. Time dissolved and form melted into the rhythm of love, their bodies entwined, resembled a hermaphrodite, their souls understood their androgynous nature, two beings locked in the embrace of the winding snakes, neither male nor female. When their minds could no longer hold the pose, they sank into mutual bliss. Sophia knew in that moment of fusion that she was not the object of her beloved's desire, and he was not hers but they were both the moon and the stars beyond the mountains and beyond the logic of man, timeless and everywhere, no beginning and no end. Thank you. So that was a section um, about the, that's the sex scene in Sophia's tale, one of them, and its function is to demonstrate the sacred act and the passionate enlightenment that follows. Um, I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but if you would like to buy Sophia's Tale, it's available on Amazon and it's also available in London's oldest esoteric bookshop, the Atlantis Bookshop on Museum Street, which is where I had a launch last month in September, um, which was absolutely wonderful. And it's also available in Boone Books on Lewis High Street. Um, so it's Sophia's Tale, a fairy tale for adults. If you read it, I hope you enjoy it. And um, please leave me an Amazon review if you feel to. No worries if you don't. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you about my approach to writing sex in novels. Um, I will give some more tips if anyone would like on this particular subject. It's a tricky one. There's lots more to talk about. Um, my PhD in creative writing actually focused on some of 
um, this uh, representing sexuality in fiction. So um, I've got a lot to say on it, but I don't know how interesting it is to you. So if you'd like